Hello to all of our working preachers out there. This is Matt Skinner. Our fall campaign is off to an amazing start, and I am grateful for all of the people who have stepped up to support this ministry. Your support provides new podcast episodes each week for both the Narrative Lectionary and the Revised Common Lectionary preachers around the globe. Your gifts make an immediate impact for millions of people at a time when biblical preaching is so desperately needed. And we need your support during this campaign to ensure that these resources continue to be available for free to all of our users. A gift of $125 will provide one new Narrative Lectionary podcast. And any gift to the fall campaign will give you on-demand access to all of the recent Craft of Preaching resources and materials. Simply go to workingpreacher.org by December 6th to double your impact and have your gift matched dollar for dollar. Thank you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. The texts for the first Sunday of Advent, uh, November 29th, 2017, are Isaiah 64, 1 through 9, Psalm 80, 1 through 7, and 17 through 19, 1 Corinthians 1, 3 through 9, and Mark 13, 24 through 37. Happy Advent, uh, Caroline and Joy. Happy Advent to you and, uh, and to Matt, who uh, was unable to be with us for this podcast because of teaching. It's uh, been a challenging uh, time as a, a, a seminary to figure out how and where and when and uh, to teach our classes. And so with scheduling, uh, he's not able to join us, which is unfortunate because this is Matt's favorite season. He loves Advent. Uh, but yes, happy Advent. And I want to start uh, by just stepping back for a minute and inviting preachers to think about this Advent uh, in, the, in the realities that, in which we live and how, uh, how these circumstances so deeply shape, of course, and we know this, but of course shape our interpretation of scripture. And I, I did a, a, a thing with a synod and some other pastors on a, an Advent sermon series uh, a couple of a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I called the sermon series "Nothing Will Be Impossible with God," looking forward to the Annunciation to Mary in the Luke text, uh, and uh, and then this first text from Mark thirteen. The title of this one uh, I called "When Things Get Revealed," and I I, I want to just invite preachers to. Uh, to read all the texts before you work on this sermon and just to get a perspective because here of course we have uh, Mark 13 uh, the you know the portion of the little apocalypse then we have the opening verses of Mark uh, and then we move to John uh, and John John not the Baptist John the witness and then of course the Annunciation and Luke and so you're moving through three different gospels We've now shifted to Mark, of course, we're Mark year, uh, year B. So there's a lot for the preacher, I think, that just kind of stop and get, get oriented to where we're going with Mark, but then also these texts and where these texts are, where, how and when, how they're speaking to you and to your congregation in this Advent season. I mean, I think we have a tendency to default and say Advent, Advent is about waiting and watching and all of those things are fine. Uh, but um, is there another way that you, we can come at these texts that, um, that are still true to the Advent season, but maybe, maybe do a focus that focuses focus us on a little different uh, different themes. So my theme for today is when things get revealed, which I will talk more about, but that's just my little, um, yes. Welcome to Advent pitch. I, I have a different pitch, different take. Uh, first of all, for those watching on YouTube, I want you to notice I've got the Advent wreath up and burning, first Sunday oh. candle. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. I need to get mine up. 
Yes. So, very good. Uh, Israel. There you go. So because Mark, this is year B is the year of Mark. And because Mark starts off um, with the appearance of the adult John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus, which we're going to get after the Christmas season, I want to suggest using the four texts from the Old Testament. Uh, because Mark doesn't have its own, you know, uh, prologue or birth narrative or annunciation narrative. What you've got is Isaiah 64, which we'll talk about in a minute, the first Sunday. Then the second Sunday, Isaiah 40, uh, right, which is the text that then frames the story of John, uh, the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Then you get Isaiah 63 and finally 2 Samuel 7, which is a messianic uh, the Messianic Annunciation, or the, uh, I shouldn't say it's a, it's a Messianic text because it is the covenant with David. That might give you uh, a way in through these texts that uh, instead of going from Mark to John to Luke. And I'm going to love Mark this year <laughs> simply because of the moment that we're in. I think um, for some, there needs to be a pause for us to recognize that um, we're entering into a season of celebration after a very hard, long year. And um, for this, and I know this sort of um, turns uh, away from what you were saying, Caroline, as well, um, but uh, I love the line that is in the uh, commentary um, where uh, she says, until God comes, do the work of God. And I think that that's getting at the text that comes out of but after that suffering. What do we do? We do the work. Do we do God's work until God comes? And, and I just think that might be a good reminder for folks who have felt the weight of this year uh, as we find hope in the coming. So that was a very different take from each and every one of us. Yeah, so boy, people have choices. Nice to have choices. Uh, okay, but let's, uh, so yes, yeah, so lots of choices there, excellent choices uh, from all of us. Let's look at Mark 13, uh, however, because this is the gospel text. Of course, this is from uh, the uh, little apocalypse, Mark, uh, Mark 13, and uh, and, you know, a, a couple of things when I suggested when things get revealed, um, one of the one of the aspects, of course, of apocalyptic literature is this. Uh, well, key to it is is revelation. And I think that's the question. The first question that I would ask a preacher to think about um, for their particular setting is what is being revealed? How is God revealing God's self uh, to your congregation? Or what is your congregation is seeing? Is, what is God revealing? Uh, and as a larger sort of apocalyptic kind of question, because that is the nature of apocalyptic. And, and in particular, when we think about Mark, which as you said, Rolf, we'll get this, uh, we'll get the baptism of Jesus uh, in particular in, uh, in Epiphany. But, uh, but that baptism moment really does guide and should guide all interpretation of Mark, uh, of the tearing of the, of, the, of the heavens. And that in that tearing, in that boundary crossing, things are getting revealed, things are getting exposed uh, that we haven't seen before. And, and again, of course, very um, critical moment because this is going into then um, Mark 14. And so those are some of the in hermeneutic, uh, hermeneutical questions that I have with regard to, you know, what is it, what is it that, what is it that Jesus is inviting his disciples to see in this moment? What will they what will they um, what will they see as revealed, uh, particularly again going into the passion narrative of Mark? Yeah, that's my problem with uh, having this text here, and I don't want to uh, litigate my my disagreements. But this text sounds so much different when you put it in its narrative context. Uh, in its narrative context, it happens right before um, all these uh, all these times. So we, uh, that is, so at the end, 
So this is Mark 13. Jesus is about to go through uh, the passion story. Therefore, keep awake, right? They're in the, uh, they're going to be in the garden. Uh, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, right? In the evening, at midnight, at cockro, at dawn, in the evening, right? Jesus gathered with his disciples for the last meal. At midnight, right? In the garden, at cockro, Peter betrays him. And at dawn, he goes on trial. And so I just think Mark 13 sounds so much different if we were to put it, you know, uh, next March, instead of here, the first Sunday of Advent. It's very confusing to me. But I will say this, and my, my mantra, and Caroline has heard it every year, enjoy, uh, this is your second year, you'll hear it this for as long as I do this. I learned from an old priest at the Roman Catholic College I went to, to think of Advent as when we celebrate God's coming to us in history, mystery, and majesty. The history, of course, Jesus. Jesus' birth to a woman, and then his life in mystery that he still comes to us now in the bread and the wine, wherever two or three are gathered in his name, whenever we uh, share a cup of water with one who thirsts or clothe the naked, you know, that is the mysterious presence of God now with us in Advent. And of course, then someday in majesty when everything will be revealed. What about preaching on the fig tree? Does that help at all, Rolf? No, I, <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I'm right here. This is uh, the, the, I think that that would be my, my take on this text in light yeah. of, um, in light of the season. Yeah. That's yeah. Uh, my take on the Mark 13 text. Yeah. Joy. I, I'm, I'm caught on the sense of, uh, uh, and I and I found the the reference uh, about the destruction of the temple that the commentator uh, commentator makes. Um, this is also coming after the question of uh, when will this be? What will this sign be? And um, everything that you listed out was are the practices that some congregations have not been engaged in all year in terms of the the mystery of of god with us where two or three are gathered because we haven't gathered where uh we've uh, uh, celebrated at the table because we've not had that or, or not everybody um, and not for the full year but for a large portion of this year that mystery has not been there it might be an opportunity for us to truly understand and the historical moment that Mark uh, 13 is written in. And what does it mean for the readers uh, who are first reflecting on this text after the destruction of the temple or in light of the destruction of the temple? Uh, so um, I, 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 I just think that we could uh, take this text and this circles back to what you were saying, Caroline. We could take this in a different direction uh, if we look at it in that. And it's 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 hard uh, because we've been waiting, and that's exactly what I think we do need to recapture in this season of Advent: is the opportunity for us to wait on God's majestic return because we have the story of God's um, uh, historical presence. And we live in the mystery of God with us now. All right, I'm gonna make my pitch for Isaiah 64. All right, let's hear it. So uh, Carolyn, you, you pointed ahead to, to uh, Mark uh, 1, mm -hmm. the, the tearing of the heavens at Jesus' baptism. Isaiah 64. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. That Isaiah 64 uh, is, uh, you know, hundreds of years before Jesus, but longing for that. Last week, uh, we heard, in, for those using the, the thematic Old Testament, I will um, send my servant David to reign over the people. And here's the longing for that. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. This, the longing for the revelation of God. And then notice what it says in verse six, which I think speaks to our time. We have all become like one who is unclean. In the midst of this pandemic, some of my friends have kids who are just so anxious 
one of my friends said, my daughter, if we go, if we go 30 seconds without wiping down a surface, if we don't all wear masks in the car, she yells at us. I mean, the anxiety or the, the sense of the uncleanliness of being infected in the pandemic. And by the way, to be unclean in the Old Testament is not to be sinful. It's to be unclean. And that's really, it just speaks to me, right? All, but all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth, it says. And so you still need God's redemptive power. I think you know, as we enter the winter in the Northern Hemisphere, the, the pandemic's gonna be worse. I think we're gonna be in for a long winter of isolation. And I think this text speaks, and then it asks God, you know, it asks God for intervention. And I love this verse. Um, There's no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you for you have hidden your face from us. Yet, O oh Lord, you, our father, you are our father and we are the clay. You are the potter recognizing that God, even though we're unclean in this moment, we are still the clay and God, the potter can work, uh, work that new creation in us. All right. That's my pitch. That's a pretty good pitch. Thanks. So right now because I love Isaiah. And so now I have to say absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> and my question for Isaiah is, uh, if you if you accept Ralph's argument and you go for it, is again this question of whose name has been made known, and what is it that uh, we refer to as as God, and is that reference recognizable as the Creator covenanting God? Mm -hmm made known in Jesus. So Ralph, you convinced me. Isaiah 64 is the one, and this is the question to ask. Who is the God that has been made known? And is that God, whose name has been made known? And is that God recognizable as a creator, covenanting God made known in Jesus? Point Ralph. Oh, ouch. <laughs> what do you mean that <laughs> there's no <laughs> so uh, the psalm uh could be used caroline liturgically because it is a very liturgical refrain based psalm awesome it's the, it's the only psalm that uh is uh is a prayer to god a shepherd give ear O shepherd of israel um but then it says three times restore us O god let your face shine that we may be saved uh you know it's uh three times it says that. And so that can be used. It could be used as a refrain in your sermon. It could be used as the, uh, as the uh, response to the prayers of the people. Mm -hmm. um, I love that. It's a great and idea. Then at the benediction, because the image of the shining face leads right, of course, to the ironic benediction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Wow. Yep. That's what I would do with a Psalm. Well, what then? Let's uh, think about the uh, First Corinthians text. Yeah, and I think um, you know here why why does this you know you know why do we have this passage and uh, probably uh, verse seven as you wait for the revealing uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ and uh, and He will also strengthen you to the end. Um, so that you might be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that that is, um, I, I think that is the promise or that's the link here, but the promise in this text, I mean, in terms of what we've already been talking about is that, uh, that, that testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you. So you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait. Um, that there's this promise of, of, of having that, the, the strength and the, uh, the presence of the spirit to give testimony to that waiting. Uh, I, I, and I think that's, you know, that's one of the things to which how Advent hears, I hear Advent so differently this year is, uh, it, this is not a, um, this is not a passive waiting. This is a, a, the waiting where we're giving testimony to what we wait for. Uh, this is a waiting that um, that counts on 
uh, the strength of our Lord to, as you were talking about early joy, to do the to, to do the work in the waiting. And so that, that those are some of the themes that I would use to bring in um, the the First Corinthians text. In that same vein, this um, in this particular season, there's a idea of um, uh, of kind of getting through uh, the crucifixion to jump to Easter, and uh, next Easter's a long way out to start talking of waiting then for hope. And so I think it. I think what you just lifted up, Caroline, is a wonderful way uh, to go at it. In that that verse right there, um, verse seven, um, that we have all we need, that we that we do not lack anything to get us through this season. And again, I think this is a year when we need to know that, both for the present moment, but also for the ultimate return of Christ. <music> 